Yes, Mothra vs. Godzilla is bad, but it so revels in its sheer badness that you cannot help but like it. This is a type of film in which you are constantly aware of the strings and effects, but in the end of it all, you just end up loving it because it is cheap. The filmmakers must have known that the original Godzilla from 1956 had many loyal fans all over the world who treasured the absurd dialogue, the bad lip-syncing, the unbelievable special effects, and the phony profundity. Godzilla, at times, looks uncannily like a man in a lizard suit, stomping on cardboard sets, as indeed he was, and he did. Other scenes show him as a stuffed, awkward, animatronic model. This was not state-of-the-art even at the time. King Kong from the 30s was much more convincing. Read up on Japanese monster movies online and you will likely come across many such lines. To a considerable chunk of Westerners, it's pretty clear-cut. These are all objectively bad films, either unintentionally so or purely as an ironic nod to a worse, sillier age when we simply didn't know better. To critics, such as the late Roger Ebert, it's clear as day. How can someone develop any kind of unironic emotional attachment to a film focusing on a giant animal portrayed by a man in an animatronic suit in this day and age? Surely, one can still lose themselves in the amazingly aged, still barely discernible from real-life effects of the 30s King Kong, but how can someone who has not dropped on their head as a small child express anything but ironic laughter upon witnessing a Godzilla film? All sarcasm aside, I do have a lot of respect for Roger Ebert and his legacy. Along with making a lot of interesting observations on live-action cinema, whether I agreed with them or not, he also had a higher understanding of Japanese animation than possibly every anime critic clique assigned anime expert out there, with the possible exception of Fred Patan. This is a man who was open-minded enough to give the original Twilight film an honest, unbiased shot, which makes his complete misunderstanding and dismissal of an entire influential genre of film all the more surprising to me. It should be no secret that, traditionally, Japanese artwork has been far less focused on realism than its Western equivalent. When hearing the words, old Japanese art, what will likely pop into many people's heads is one of the hyper-stylized works of Hokusai, or other creations similarly uninterested in replicating reality. In a TV show like The Muppets, seeing the hand of the puppeteer is considered a huge mistake. Despite the fact that absolutely no one in their right mind would interpret Kermit as a real frog, or indeed anything but a silly hand puppet. Meanwhile, Japanese bunraku puppet shows have, since 1684, not given the slightest damn about hiding that aspect from their audience. This, naturally, carries over into animation. The traditional American Disney animation method has been that of the illusion of life, dissolving the hand of the animator into a living, breathing world of his creation. Meanwhile, the Japanese have traditionally seen their animation as moving drawings, with various elements shifting stylistically and technically depending on who is animating the scene, and with the initial budget constraint of lower frame counts being turned into an outright advantage. Not seeing hyperfluid realistic animation as an ultimate goal allowed Japanese animators to screw around and develop various personal animation styles, including that of the beloved and very influential Yoshinori Kanada. And oh man, don't even get me started on video games. Japanese RPGs and Western ones are so tonally and artistically different, it's insane. Therefore, it's not a huge surprise that aside from a minority of Japanese dorks, people who haven't grown up in Japanese culture will have trouble understanding such a culturally specific genre. Ebert enjoyed the 95 Gamera film, but assumed it must have been ironic enjoyment that what he felt was not earnest childish joy but a knowing, sophisticated awareness of the badness of every aspect of the film, which then provoked laughter. He also failed to take note of the obvious difference in production quality between the 90s Gamera trilogy and the old, low-budget Godzilla knockoff series. The 95 Gamera was simply regarded as a so-bad-it's-good film, no acknowledgement was made to things like the creative cinematography. While having a lot of intentionally silly moments, the film also features some genuinely clever subtext, and arguably a better metaphor for nuclear warfare than even Godzilla himself. 
If you let go of your biases, you might realize that there is far more to appreciate to these movies than mere ironic camp. With the amount of thought and effort that can be put into everything from cohesive narrative themes, creature designs, the quality of the suits and animatronics, the way the shots are composed, and the sheer detail that some of these miniature sets can feature, it's a little silly to assume that such works are only made for the sake of a few cheap, ironic laughs. It only gets even more interesting once you take budget into account. Going back to Ebert's earlier comparison between Godzilla and King Kong, if you adjust for inflation, the former was made with less than half of the budget of the latter. And yet even more interestingly, the third film from the 90s Gamera trilogy was made with only 22% of the budget of the very first Star Wars film. Making an extremely direct comparison between Japanese and American special effects is not only culturally ignorant, it would be like watching an Osamu Dezaki animated film and wondering why it's not as fluidly animated as a Disney movie. I'm obviously not the first to have made these observations, so this is when I'll have to guide you towards some further reading. Check out the writings of Bill Warren and David Collat, along with Peter Chung's posts about Japanese animation on the Anipages Daily Forum for some examples. Warren in particular recounts the interesting tale of the 1980 American-Japanese collaboration film Virus, its American work being redone by the Japanese studio who wanted the images to not be realistic but merely visually evocative. Or you can simply check out the life work of Takashi Murakami, whose surprisingly thoughtful yet, in my opinion, a tad too nationalistic cultural analysis of the traditional super flatness of Japanese art is now being misrepresented as an anti-moe, anti-otaku dietary by many pretentious internet users, book authors, and journalists who copy-paste all of their expertly gathered knowledge from a fundamentally broken Wikipedia article. With a director as willfully misunderstood for the sake of agenda pushing as Hideaki Anno, I have little doubts that Western audiences will project large amounts of irony into the new Godzilla film. After all, the deconstructional, anti-otaku, super-flat creator Hideaki Anno would never lower himself to this B-movie trash, if not for some very important ulterior motive, right? If anyone you know tries to make this claim, simply call them out. Also, point them towards Diddy Bro's summary of Anno, as it is one of the few non-delusional and fact-based summaries of the man's life on any English language source. Also, for God's sake, stay far away from Eva geeks. Sometimes your emotional inner child just knows better than the grown-up, bill-paying, discerning adult with supposedly objective standards on the outside. Whether it involves giant stompy nuke metaphors or not, I recommend looking back with a more open mind at one or two things that you initially felt you only enjoyed in a manner that was ironic. There might just have been more craft and intelligence involved in their creation than you'd initially thought.